hello team and welcome back to the channel so before we start i would request you make sure to subscribe to the channel we are very close to 50,000 subscribers and you will find lots of amazing videos completely hands-on on devops as well as cloud devops so make sure to subscribe to the channel in order to receive notifications for those videos okay also team for those who are looking for training sessions you can enroll to this course which is batch 4 starting from 10th of march the best part about this course is that first of all you will be getting recordings from batch 3 as well in addition to that what you will be getting is that i am going to take live sessions on weekends but one hour on each uh, like one hour in on wednesday i will be guiding you with each tool corporate guidance basically explaining you uh, like preparing you for interviews like what kind of things you should learn what kind of questions you should prepare what kind of things they are going to ask with respect to interviews so that also will be giving for those who are getting registered into batch 4 and in addition to that obviously you are going to have corporate kind of projects which you can explain in your interviews okay and obviously i'm going to guide uh, properly how you should be explaining that so if you are interested make sure to enroll now with that being said let's get started so in today's session we are going to learn about kubernetes okay and we are going to learn in very deep so that if you are going for interviews you can easily answer any question with respect to kubernetes okay so first of all let's understand the agenda what exactly we are going to cover today so first of all we are going to see what exactly is kubernetes and what problem does it solve because as i say any uh, tool that exists in devops it is solving a problem that's why it exists okay after that we are going to understand the architecture okay architecture of kubernetes on master node okay and worker node okay and after that we are going to see the workflow basically in workflow we are going to see like whenever like when we send a deployment to be done over kubernetes what exactly is the process that is being followed okay in detail we are going to see that after that we are going to see the components of kubernetes okay after components we are going to see uh, we are going to basically set up kubernetes okay and in setup i am going to show you setting up two kinds of kubernetes one is going to be self hosted which is going to be on our local system using virtual machines and second kubernetes that i want to show you setting up is eks okay uh, basically kubernetes on aws after that we are going to understand rbac role based role based access control how exactly it works and what exactly does it mean okay and after that we are going to do proper ci cd to understand everything we are going to consolidate whatever we learned we are going to consolidate through a proper ci cd demo okay and this is what we are going to cover okay okay so let's begin from the first so first thing that we should know it <coughs> is what exactly is kubernetes okay so the general definition that we see is like kubernetes is an open source uh, platform that is used to orchestrate docker containers okay and not just that it can also automate deployment scaling up of containers as well as it is going to provide healing factors okay now you might be a little bit confused okay what exactly this means what is uh, container orche orchestration what exactly does it mean okay in short you can understand container management okay but yeah we'll understand better through an example so before that first of all we should know kubernetes is created by google but at this point it is being managed by cncf okay which is short for cloud native computing foundation they are the ones who is managing it managing kubernetes now okay now <laughs> let us understand uh, kubernetes through a scenario so let's say uh, i created my docker container okay on a virtual machine okay and my application is running fine but somehow after some time uh, i am seeing that my application is not accessible okay so when i see my application is not accessible i went to my docker container to see the status and there i can see that it is crashed okay it is crashed or having some issues okay so for what i can do i can try to like restart my docker container or i can my <coughs> i can recreate the docker container right other than that what i can go what i can do i can check the logs of docker container and based on that i can perform some action to fix it okay now the problem is that okay i saw the application uh, 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 like crashed so i got to know okay something wrong with my container okay but obviously i may not be available 24 hours to monitor the application to monitor the docker container if it is running fine or not right 
and that's why we have kubernetes so instead of creating a docker container on any local machine or anywhere else what we do we create docker container inside a cluster known as kubernetes cluster okay now i'll tell you the benefit of it what is going to be the benefit this is let's say a cluster a kubernetes cluster and inside it i created the uh, docker container for my application okay so you know uh, what what is going to happen first thing if like uh, uh, some issue is happening with the container okay so you know kubernetes is first of all it's going to monitor the container 24 hours okay and if, if if kubernetes sees that okay container is like having some issues few things it can do for example like it can restart it can restart our container it can redeploy the container okay that means we don't need to be worry about monitoring our application 24 hour instead kubernetes is going to do that on our behalf okay <coughs> that is one thing secondly let's say i decide that i want to give 4 gb of ram to my application while deployment so that also we can mention in the con configuration file for kubernetes and that also can be done okay and as i say 24 hours monitoring what exactly is going kubernetes going to do so there are two uh, things that kubernetes can easily do one is known as liveness probe okay basically it is uh, using this what we can do we can like mention the configuration of this and define the time period so let's say i define 10 seconds okay so every 10 seconds kubernetes is going to check if the container is running or not okay that is one form of monitoring that kubernetes can do second kind of thing uh, is readiness probe okay readiness probe so in that you know again we de define the configuration and we define the time period as 10 seconds so you know what kubernetes is going to do every 10 seconds it's going to check the application okay let's say i deployed a, a website so <coughs> kubernetes will check if the traffic is coming and going in the website or not okay because if i deploy a, a application let's say i deployed a website right so if website is running on google or like uh, in public environment people will be accessing it right people will come and go visit the site like that okay that means traffic is coming so kubernetes can check that using readiness probe and it will continuously check and let us know if our application is running or not okay basically if our application is accessible or not okay you can see how useful this is right it first of all it reduces so much of manual effort because one time we just start the deployment do the deployment afterward monitoring will be done by kubernetes uh, resolving of uh, like uh, basic issues can be done by kubernetes right in addition to that kubernetes is properly going to manage also container manage the container okay and that is why since it is going to monitor it's uh, using kubernetes we can define how much resources we should we can give to uh, like uh, our application we can perform uh, like monitoring in different ways like liveness probe readiness probe right so all those things can be done when we deploy the docker container inside kubernetes and the benefit as you can see first of all 24 hours monitoring can be done very easily okay we don't need to worry about checking the application if it is running fine or not kubernetes can do that on our behalf okay this means it reduces lot of manual effort okay and that is the best part also you know uh, let's say we have not just one but we have <coughs> so many applications okay so many application like container one container two container three so you know all these things can be uh, monitored at the same time they can be taken care of everything okay and also one more thing you know kubernetes can help us do is like manage the load manage load for example my application is running and it is getting overloaded okay so basically we can create uh, multiple copies of the container okay and in that way if there are multiple cop copies then it is like load can be distributed that also we can do using certain features of kubernetes okay so you see this is one of the problem that kubernetes is solving okay it helps us reducing the manual effort and it is going to monitor 24 hours our application it can take some precaution measures if something goes wrong it can self heal it can fix the container it can restart it can redeploy it can manage the load it can like perform uh, uh, checkings on the container if it is running fine or not it can check if the application is running fine or not traffic is coming or not okay so so many these are certain features that i just defined but in addition to that there are so many other features also which kubernetes can perform and that is the benefit of it okay 
so that's why we say that kubernetes first of all what is that kubernetes complete is available completely free right that means is open source okay first thing secondly what it's doing here from the, this uh, understanding you can understand it's managing the container correct it's managing the container and that's why we say it's a, a container orchestration tool right so <coughs> that's why the definition goes like something like this okay? kubernetes is an open source platform that is uh, that that helps us to manage our uh, uh, container okay side by side it can also automate deployment right automate deployment we can do we can uh, like manage load so many things we can do right and that's why kubernetes exists okay so now you know what exactly is kubernetes okay now let us understand the architecture of kubernetes and understand how exactly does it work okay so now let us understand about the architecture of kubernetes okay so let me just write it here also okay so okay so in architecture basically we are going to have two kinds of nodes in uh, kubernetes okay when i say node it's nothing but a vm or you can even even say virtual machine okay okay so that you should know first of all okay secondly as i mentioned two kinds of node we are going to have first kind is known as master node sorry about that so first kind we are going to have a master node second kind one we are going to have as worker node okay now the main difference between these two okay uh, you might be thinking okay when a virtual machine machine becomes master node or a worker node okay so basically this is the process to make a master node a worker node what we do let's say we have this virtual machine okay we have this virtual machine so basically what we are going to do we are going to install certain set of tools and we are going to do certain configuration on this vm to convert this vm into master node or worker node okay for example like we are going to make sure that it has docker it has some component kubernetes components like uh, uh, like kubelet it's going to have kubeproxy and some networking configuration so when we install all those things inside the vm it becomes a master node or worker node depends on the configuration okay now uh, one more thing that you should know here okay a master what exactly is a master node so master node from the name suggest it's going to it's going to manage the worker nodes okay let's say it's master node and you know we may have multiple worker node also okay for example let's say uh, this is node 1 worker node 1 and this is let's say this is uh, worker node 2 so master node what it's going to do it's going to manage these two okay you, you might be thinking okay why we are having virtual, uh, multiple worker nodes so basically let's say we have one application okay uh, which requires 8 gb of ram okay and then we have second application that requires 20 gb of ram okay so in that case you know what we will uh, let's say this is the uh, uh, let's say it is uh, uh 15 gb size 15 gb ram this worker node is having okay and this worker node is having around let's say uh, 25 gb okay so let's say when it comes to deploy uh, app one okay so we uh, master node it will check out ki which worker node is having the capability to host this so you can see both are having okay but here since it is available so we are going to host the uh, application here okay AJ app one will be de uh, like deployed on node one and let's say for 20 gb second application the master node will check okay this node is having enough space so we can deploy the 20 gb application on second node okay so for that reason like in, uh, in order to uh, like host enough applications we can have multiple uh, uh, nodes worker nodes okay and but but for example here you see like one master node and two worker node right but it is possible if there are so many hundreds of worker node so one master node cannot manage 100 worker nodes right so in order to manage those worker node we are going to have multiple master node also but master node is also always going to be le much lesser than number of worker nodes okay this is what the basic structure in detail we are going to go but first but first let's understand basic thing so what we understand here okay, okay we are going uh, we are going to have two kind of nodes one is master node one is worker node 
and node is nothing but just a virtual machine with specific amount of RAM, specific amount of CPU and specific amount of storage. That amount will depend on the requirement of the company. Okay. For example, like in my company, we used to have a worker node of size minimum we are having like 32 GB of RAM. Okay. And like around 150 GB of storage or like 200 GB of storage. Okay. Okay. So you understand ki two, uh, two kinds of node we are having master and worker master node is the node that is going to manage the worker nodes okay and you know when we deploy the application those applications are going to be deployed on worker node not on master node they are going to be deployed on worker nodes okay and we can have so many multiple uh, like number of worker node and in order to manage all those worker node we may we, we, uh, maybe need to have uh, more number of master node as well because one single master node cannot handle hundreds of worker node right okay so this is clear now let us understand what kind of process we need to have on master node as well as on worker node okay so let me explain you that as well okay so let's say uh, this is master node okay So first process that will be running on this master node is known as API server. Okay. Then we are going to have etcd. I'll explain each one of them in detail. Okay. And the flow as well. Then we may have a scheduler. Okay. And we may have controller also. These are the some uh, like uh, process that is running on master node. Okay. This is master node and let's say we are having let's say we are having two worker node okay so talking about what kind of process this is uh, worker node one so the process that will be running on this worker node is going to be first of all we are going to have kubelet okay then we are going to have container runtime okay and then we are going to have cube proxy okay this is node one right second node also we are going to have same process okay first we are going to have kubelet then container runtime then cube proxy okay and this is worker node two and yeah both the worker nodes is going to be managed by master node okay now let us understand what exactly this means okay so let me explain you in detail so in order to understand the architecture we need to understand one small concept before that okay so you know like when we want to uh, deploy or run our application we use like docker container we create a container and inside that container our, our application runs right and we can create container on like on our uh, local machine on any virtual machine anywhere we can create create it right so this is like simple uh, one second this is like simple docker container inside which our application may run okay but as i mentioned ki when we create the container inside kubernetes we do not directly just create the container okay so container is created inside a component of kubernetes which is known as pod okay so it will be container only but it will be inside a, another component which is known as pod pod is also the smallest unit of kubernetes okay pod is like smallest unit in kubernetes okay so whenever we want to like run our application so the uh, container of the application is created is inside the pod okay and one of the main difference between pod and container is that key first of all pod has container along with some other configurations in addition to that pod can have multiple container inside it okay but generally we keep just one okay so you can see this is the basic one of the difference so when we say like we want to create container we don't say create container we say we are going to create the application pod okay and that's what we are going to when we like see when we say okay i want to create the container inside which our application will run okay in general same thing we do here but that container is created inside the pod and we say okay application pod is created application pod is created that means container is created and application should be running and we should be able to access it okay so that thing you should know here gen in general like uh, application running inside container same container it, it is created inside a pod and we say only we talk about pod okay this is application pod okay okay now let's talk about the components 
so this is master node and these are two worker node okay few basic things again uh, just summarizing master node is the one node that is going to manage the worker nodes okay and when we deploy any application through pods those pods are going to be created on worker nodes okay if there are multiple worker nodes then based on availability like how much resources is available on what node based on that our pod is going to be created okay now you can see these uh, separate uh, things are inside each node right master node has four process then worker node is also each worker node is having three process right so let me explain you about each of the process okay talking about master node so first process that runs on master node is known as api server okay now api server is also known as cluster gateway that means like whenever any kind of request come for example like i want to deploy an application okay so when i want to i want to tell that kubernetes tell that to kubernetes okay so my request i should be going here to my request first goes to api server as i say because it is cluster gateway so any kind of communication that i need to do with respect to kubernetes so my request i need to communicate with Kube, uh, this api server okay that means if i send any request uh, let me yeah let's say i have some request i want to deploy an application so my request will be going to api server okay it will go to api server and then from here it will decide okay what needs to happen okay but basically whenever any kind of request is there to like uh, upgrade a component or like uh, uh, scale in like scale up the pod or like deploy in a new application so all those requests will be going to api server api server is the main part main communication from external to kubernetes is going to happen through api server okay that is first uh, process runs on master node get okay next is process that is there on master node is known as etcd okay it is also called as cluster brain when i say cluster brain this is because it stores information okay it stores information about cluster configuration whichever pod is created being created where application deploy like every kind of information it will be having okay and one thing that you need to know about etcd is that it stores information in the form of key value pair when i say key value pair that means in this format it's going to have okay for example let me explain you through an example one second this is the general format and in uh, key value pair we can have like for example let's say name okay so let me increase the size as well so that you people can understand clearly sorry about that I actually rarely use this dot dot io so okay so when i say key value pair that means there will be one uh, uh, like uh, one word that is going to be key and second word is going to be the value differentiated by this uh, column okay for example key is name its value is aditya okay so you can see this is the format in which its cd is going to have information stored okay and as, as i say its cd is also known as cluster brain okay cluster brain which in, so hold uh, stores information in the form of key value pair and stores information about cluster configuration and whatever like whatever things is happening it stores information okay third third process that we have is ha uh, scheduler okay so what exactly scheduler okay so scheduler from the name itself you can understand it is supposed to schedule something okay for example let's say i send a request to uh, kubernetes through api server i want to deploy my application okay so for deploying the application we need to create pods right so those pods where they are going to be created for example as i say ki there are multiple worker node right so where exactly they are going to be created that decision is taken by scheduler the scheduler is going to assign a worker node that okay this is the worker node on which the newly request that came is going to be created on what basis it's going to decide so scheduler is going to decide based on availability as well as requirement for example the uh, pod that needs to be created it requires let's say uh, 30 40 gb of ram okay so scheduler will check you okay which worker node is uh, having that much uh, ram available so on that it is going to assign so that node will be assigned to that pod and pod uh, will be created on that worker node okay so that is the job of scheduler okay <coughs> next up we have controller 
okay and do not worry we are going to understand together the workflow how exactly like when request come where it will be going then what will be happening afterwards so that process also we are going to understand but first let us understand each of the process one by one okay so next up we have controller okay it's it is its full name is controller manager you can say okay so now you might be thinking okay what exactly controller is going to do okay so controller basically it is going to detect the changes state changes for example let's say uh, Kuban, like we have deployed our application and a pod is running for the application okay so let's say for some reason controller managers uh, for some reason the pod of the application it got uh, like destroyed or it got scaled down or it got stopped or it got removed anything you can say okay for some reason so this is like a state change some changes happened so those changes will be automatically detected by controller manager it will detect okay as soon as it detects okay this pod is down so if pod is down it needs to get up right so what controller manager is going to do it's going to sh uh, inform scheduler okay this pod is down it needs to be created so quickly scheduler is going to decide where this pod is uh, the new pod that is uh, new pod where it should be created okay so controller manager what it does it is basically detects state changes what kind of changes are being done with respect to like uh, replication controller then we have pods okay so that is what controller does okay so this is what the process that runs on master node okay summarizing it again api server which is the cluster gateway you can see whatever request needs to come to kubernetes we communicate it through api server okay so outside communication with kubernetes can happen through api server then we have etcd which is the cluster brain which stores information about cluster configuration and everything else and it stores information in the form of key value pair okay example you can see here right name is the key value is the aditya okay then we have scheduler from the name itself we can understand scheduler is what it's going to schedule where our pods should be created on which worker node how does it decide it decides based on what is the requirement and what is the availability okay then we have controller manager so controller manager its task is to detect the state changes okay for example if pod is dead then it's quickly it's detect, detect that change and inform scheduler ki pod one pod is down you need to decide on which worker node it needs to be done okay it needs to be created so this is what the process runs on master node talking about worker node okay so in worker node we are going to have three most important process one is kubelet one is container runtime then we have kube proxy each worker node is going to have these three process running okay okay talking about what these processes are first we have kubelet okay so you know like a, a scheduler is going to decide on which node a pod should be created right but the creation of pod is done by kubelet that you should know so kubelet is responsible for creating the pod or any that resource whatever resource needs to be created with respect to any application that we want to deploy so those are going to be created by kubelet then we have container runtime from the name itself you can understand it's something related to docker containers right so whatever containers that uh, we are going to create within the pod so that is done by container runtime that is managed by container runtime component or process you can say okay then we have kube proxy so what you know like obviously like if there are multiple pods of an application so communication between them how it's going to be done so all the networking aspect as well as communication and everything that is managed by kube proxy in short if in interviews they ask you what exactly is kube proxy you can say you can mention that <coughs> kube proxy is the com uh, is responsible for managing the networking in inside our cluster okay so that is kube proxy okay and these three are the main components of worker node kubelet container runtime and kube proxy kubelet is the component a process that is going to response that is responsible for creating the pods or any other components that is needed then we have container runtime container runtime is something that is responsible for managing the containers and then we have kube proxy which is responsible for all the networking aspect okay so this is the basic architecture or the you can say main architecture of kubernetes okay and now we should be uh, let me explain you the uh, workflow when i say workflow that means what is going to happen when i send the request for deployment of an application how things are going to be connected and how the application will be getting deployed okay so let me show you that as well
okay team so now let us discuss about the workflow of the uh, deployment over kubernetes okay so we are going to understand how exactly uh, when a request comes for like creation of an application or deployment inside kubernetes how exactly it gets done okay so let's say a uh, first like uh, a request is created okay there is a request for uh, let's say deployment of application one okay now as i mentioned uh, Q, uh, api server is the cluster gateway okay that means the request will be going first to api server correct so uh, request went to api server now api server what it's going to do first of all it's going to validate the request that means if a request is coming a request uh, from wherever it is coming that uh, that uh, person or location should be having the credentials to uh, communicate with kubernetes right so that request is going to be validated first afterwards api server is going to store the information of like pods for example I we are sending a request okay we want to create this application pod okay so that information key uh, like uh, what kind of pod is going to be created and everything is stored by api server inside etcd okay that is that happens first after validation of the request so after that what happens scheduler okay scheduler will get to know quickly that a new pod is supposed to be created okay so <coughs> scheduler will get to know that a new pod needs to be created then its, ta its task is that to uh, get a suitable node okay suitable worker node inside which it can create the uh, pod okay so <coughs> this is like assessment okay it's going to uh, scheduler is going to de decide okay the, on which worker node i want to create the i want to uh, like as which on which worker node i <coughs> i want to make sure that node is created okay so that is done after that after that de uh, decision is taken scheduler is going to uh, update okay scheduler is going to update this information what information okay uh, on which node the pod is going to be created okay and where this information is updated etcd now you might be thinking everyone is like trying to update the information over etcd why is that because as i mentioned etcd is the cluster brain and in, uh, it stores complete information about the cluster configuration as well as like whatever new things are created so that other components like uh, uh, controller they can also get information from its city key uh, where are the what are the state changes okay that is why every information is stored inside each city okay so that is done scheduler is like uh, decided okay on this worker node the <coughs> pod should be created okay and as i mentioned key creation of the pod is done by the component if you remember kubelet right so now based on the information that exists inside its city kubelet is going to create the pod okay now kubelet will create the pod okay for <coughs> application pod is created okay now once application is pod is created immediately another component which is cube proxy okay it's going to enable the network rules uh, network rules for communication for this specific pod okay so that once the uh, like network rules are uh, enabled so as soon as these are, those are enabled then pod can communicate to and fro to other components like other components can communicate with this pod and this pod can also communicate with other components other pods okay so this is how deployment does does happen okay you might be thinking okay i don't see anywhere a controller component right so basically com controller component is most useful when deployment is already done okay so once deploy let's say uh, once uh, uh, this pod is deployed right so <coughs> if this pod is deployed and let's say it is running fine somehow suddenly something happened wrong something went wrong so what the, that in that like wrong wrongfulness will be detected by another component which is controller okay controller will qu quickly uh, understand okay this pod is crashed down or like pod is deleted or something happened okay so if that information as soon as controller gets it will inform scheduler okay and scheduler will start the same process find the node on which the new pod that can be created and then kubelet will create it okay so this is how all the components are created uh, one more component <coughs> that you might not be able to see here is container runtime 
so that will be like used while creating the container inside the pod okay but in general this is the flow that happens any request comes first that request is going to go to api server which is the cluster gateway and api server is going to validate the request okay and whatever component that needs to be created that information is stored in etcd as soon as that is stored scheduler will understand okay new pod needs to be created okay because all these components can see the like uh, updates or information in etcd okay so scheduler uh, first of all it will find the suitable node based on requirement like let's say requirement is like we need to have 4 gb of ram for the application so it will do a find the suitable worker node that has that availability okay <coughs> and it will uh, mention that information node uh, which node on which uh, on the node on which the pod is supposed to be created it uh, scheduler will update that information inside etcd as soon as that is done then uh, kubelet will start creation of the pod kubelet will create the pod and kubeproxy will enable the network rules for communication from and to the pod okay and then uh, this pod after it's running fine if anything goes wrong controller will quickly detect the changes and it will if pod is down it will inform scheduler that this this pod needs to be created again or like restarted something like that okay so this is how the flow of work that happens over kubernetes okay so <coughs> yes now let us talk about the components of kubernetes okay team so now we are going to discuss about the fundamental components of kubernetes okay and it will be much easier to understand if we try to understand it through an example okay for example uh, let's say i have an application who is having a front end okay and back end and let's say it is having a database okay so you know like uh, when we previously before kubernetes and we are deploying applications we used to create containers okay and i just mentioned you that uh, in kubernetes we are going to create pods containers will be running inside the pods okay so let's say we created three pods for this application first pod is going to be front end pod second pod is going to be a back end pod third pod is going to be database pod okay okay now as soon as the these pods are created uh, they will be having their own ip addresses okay so it's good that uh, like through ip address they can communicate okay you know the problem that will appear let's say uh, we have created the pods and for some reason let's say uh, this pod front end pod got deleted and we have to recreate a new one okay so uh, as soon as we create a new one there will be a new ip address okay there will be a different ip address now if is it this pod front end pod is having a new ip address that is not known by a back end component as well as database component right so that is a very big problem so how this problem we can solve before that first of all i hope you understand pod which is one of the smallest unit of which is the smallest unit of kubernetes okay and yeah so a container will be running inside the pod okay and the problems uh, we have is that uh, like for communication among the pods if we try to communicate through the using the ip addresses of the pods it will be problematic if the pod got deleted and we created a new one in that way new ip address will be there and these backend and database won't be uh, database pods won't be able to know the new ip address right so to avoid this situation you know what what solution was given ki instead of communication between uh, pods uh, let's say this is the front end pod this is going to be backend and this is going to be database pod okay so instead of using the pod ip address to communicate among them we have another component okay which is known as service so each pod is going to have its own service okay let's say all these three pods they are having their own service okay now service will be connected to its respective pod okay and in order to communicate let's say uh, front end uh, back end needs to communicate okay so communication will be happening through service you know the benefit of it because service will also be having an ip address and this ip address that does not get changed that means even if the front end pod got deleted and a new pod got created still the service ip address won't be changed okay and for, and new pod as soon as it gets created it will be attached to the service okay that means communication can be easily done because we are using the 
uh, service okay and service ip address is not at all going to change okay similar way communication between database pod also can be done using its respective service okay so now you know uh, we have pod and we have service okay pod is the uh, like uh, uh, smallest unit in kubernetes and it uh, container run inside the pod of an application container run inside the pod and we have service what is service service is a component which is going to be used for communication uh, among the pods okay service is going to be used for communication you know one more thing a service can be used for which is load balancer which i will discuss in a few minutes but let us first cover the rest of the components okay okay let's say a uh, front end it has specific okay let's forget for front end let's say database okay so it is possible that in order to access database we may require some user password right if if we want that front end should be able to access database or it, it should be able to connect to database it should be a front end should be having access to database username and password right now how do we give to front end the database uh, username password of database okay so, so you know in order to make the because this is a sensitive data right username password it's a sensitive data so in order to make sure that this is this data is secure what we do we use another component of kubernetes which is known as secrets okay so secrets is a component which is used to store credentials or sensitive data okay now what will be happening key we will be having a component secrets okay and this secret will hold the credentials of database okay so now in order for uh, this uh, in order for front end component to access database it can get the user uh, credentials from secret and then it can connect to database okay so third component that we have is secrets okay but obviously you know like uh, uh, if you let's say for example let's say we have a website okay and it is uh, like uh, it has a login page also so in order to access to this website what we need to have we need to have the url of the website and user password right same in the case of database also username password we are able to provide using secrets right but we need to provide the url of the database also information about the database okay so for that we have another component in kubernetes which is known as config map okay now this config map component it's going to store information about the database okay from where it can be accessed again front end needs to access database first it's going to get the uh, information about the database from config map url you can say and then secrets and once front end has both the things then it can access database right so we have four components now config map okay pod service secrets config map four components done right let's talk about another thing so you know when we are having database we will be using database to store information correct but it's possible that let's say key uh, database we have stored certain information inside database and for some reason uh, database pod crashed and we have to create a new pod so if we have to create a new pod what about the data that we stored previously that will also get deleted okay so in order to make sure that data, that data is not getting deleted what we do we attach a volume okay what we do we create a volume on some other location some other uh, virtual machine okay and we at attach that volume to here okay so let's say this volume so we this uh, this volume can be created using a component known as pv pv is it is short for persistence volume okay so we are going to create another component persistent uh, pv which is persistent volume where we will define ki some amount of storage will be available okay now in order uh, the reason for creating persistent volume is that ki once we attach the persistent volume with our database so next time if database got deleted database pod got deleted and a new pod got created still data inside the uh, pod database pod is not getting removed anywhere okay you can see so that is like pers we are persisting the data okay that is also known as stateful set because state is not getting even though it's uh, like a database comp a pod will be created new one but the previous data also exist okay now 
how we, how this database pod can access persistent volume through a, another component which is known as pvc which is short for persistent volume claim okay so it is a component which can be used to connect to this uh, pv okay basically like database want to use their volume persistent volume so it has to request it okay now request can be done using a component known as pvc which is persistent volume claim and <coughs> then this uh, through this component uh, like volume can be used from here volume can be requested from persistent volume okay now to show you a proper structure for the same things let me show you the proper structure okay okay team so now let me explain you through a, a example okay so let's say we are having an application okay which is having three components a front end component back end component and a database component okay as i mentioned each component will have its own service so that communication can establish from the diagram you can understand a database component back end component and we have front end component okay and they are the communication between these three pods is going to happen through their own respective services okay one more thing one small thing that you should know team is that ki uh, the uh, request if if an external request comes to access any component that request will be first forwarded to service and from service it goes to the pod no request will be going directly to the pod first the request will be going to a uh, service then to pod okay and you know at whatever application we are having to access the application what we do we access through front end okay and that's why let's say i have deployed this application this application is running in order to access the application over browser we need to go to front end service and from there we'll be able to access the application that you should know okay now again talking about these three let's say pod we have created okay and once pod is created so uh, their service also we are creating so that communication can be done between these pods okay so that is done right afterwards what is going to happen as i mentioned ki front end may be needed to connect to the database pod right because we want to write some data inside the uh, this database pod right so what things do we need so we need access to uh, database url which will be stored inside a file known as what it known as it's known as config map okay it's going this is the component which will be storing the credentials for uh, this database sorry uh, the url of this database you can say okay second thing that we need to have is the credential for this database okay so for that also we can take help from uh, like we are storing the credentials where we are storing we are storing the credentials inside a file known as secret okay so inside that file we are storing this 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 secret file is storing database credentials and this secret file is storing the front end credentials okay these things will be more clear once we do the demo uh, i'll show you that as well okay so okay so credentials we have your uh, config map which contains the database url so now front end can easily access the database okay now as i mean <coughs> as i mentioned ki uh, database pod it contains data which we want that even the database pod gets deleted okay and we are creating a new database pod still the data inside the database pod should not be lost so for that we are going to use persistent volume we are going to create a physical storage on another machine okay and then we are going to connect that storage to our database pod that means every time even if the database pod get deleted but the physical storage which is which is on another location does not get deleted okay so next time a new database pod gets created still the data inside the pod that we created previously will be persisting okay okay but we cannot directly access the persistent volume we need to have another component pvc which is persistent volume claim so database pod is going to use that pvc to request for storage from pv okay and this is how a uh, basic architecture of an application works okay in this architecture you can understand this it is having three components front end back end database each component is having its own service which will be used for communication and to access the application once it is deployed we will be requesting to front end service because uh, to access the uh, like to get access to application we cannot directly request the application we need to send request to service okay service will forward our request to 
front end pod and then we'll be able to access the uh, of application okay what we are doing we are storing credentials in a file known as secrets and we are storing database information or url inside a file known as uh, config map okay so these are the components and this is the basic architecture of an application general architecture you can even say okay now similar kind of structure we are going to build and deploy okay so let me show you that okay before that one more thing let me tell you ki <coughs> there is a uh, term known as replica okay now you might be thinking okay what exactly is replica so let me tell you let's say uh, we have deployed a website which is uh, accessible through front end pod okay and the website is getting so much of traffic so many people are visiting the website it's getting overloaded okay so what we do in that case to like reduce overload we create multiple pod of the uh, application okay now these are like same pod okay these are like uh, same pod you can say and everyone is having connected through uh, these components also okay let me and they are all connected to this service i'll explain the reason why we are having three uh, three pods for the same okay now as i mentioned ki uh, we are going to access the application through front end and front end is getting overloaded because so many people are visiting the website okay so what we do we create a copy of this uh, pod like three copies of this pod will be existing okay so that load can be distributed now load how it will be getting distributed so that will be also that will also be done by service okay so service is also can be used as load balancer okay what it's going to do whatever request is coming so service will check ki which which pod is having less uh, load so it will forward the request to that okay let's say 10 request came so it, they were forwarded to front end pod 1 okay afterward more request came then service saw that okay pod 1 is occupied already it has having so many request so it will forward the request to second pod which may have less request okay and this is how uh, like service component is doing the load balancing okay so that no component is overloaded okay and these copies are known as replicas okay that we can define while create doing the deployment okay so in this way uh, like these are replicas okay okay so i hope this is clear now let's do one thing let's uh, do demo proper demo okay so let's do that okay team so now what i want to show you is how to set up self hosted kubernetes when i say self hosted kubernetes that means we are going to get virtual machines make some uh, virtual machine as master node and others as worker node okay so for this what i'm going to do first of all uh, create three virtual machines okay and i'm going to create ubuntu this will be yeah 20.04 and this will be large i'm going to take and i have my security group just to show you what are the ports open in my security group let me open it here security group and this is the primary one okay and these are the ports open let me just remove the uh, not required ports okay so that you can understand okay so this is fine and this is the ports i would recommend you you can open okay 27017 this is going to be used for a uh, mongodb database 465 so in case in jenkins when you want to send email notifications using uh, g through gmail you can use this port and 6443 so when we set up our kubernetes this will be a port used by api and then we have ssh port which is going to be used for connected to our vm then we have https port in case we set up or use https then we have at port which is for http okay now in general i open 3000 to 10000 port because most of the applications i can uh, like run in that specific uh, direction okay in specific port okay like 8080 8081 9000 5000 like that okay then we have this port range 30000 to 32768 okay and uh, i'll explain in a bit why uh, i have opened this port basically like when we deploy applications okay so as i mentioned ki uh, we can access the applications through service right 
and service is of multiple kinds okay so yeah let me maybe let me explain you service kind so that it is more clear to understand service types okay so for service types uh, types basically we are going to have four types of service okay first one known as cluster ip second type is known as node port okay third type is load balancer and last type is ingress okay now let me explain you one by one what exactly they are and so okay first thing i hope you remember that service is going to be used for communication right some service may be used for internal communication some service may be used for internal to external like that okay so let's talk about first uh, cluster ip okay so let's say we are having uh, pods okay let's say this is the pod 1 this is pod 2 and this is pod 3 and these are replicas okay so we can have one service for all of them right well let's call this service as s1 these are replicas means uh, these are of the same pod okay let's say another another uh, pod we are having three another pods which is going to be uh, p4 p5 p6 okay and they are also replicas connected to one service and let's call this service s2 okay now when you create a service we need to define in the configuration file what kind of service we want to use in case we don't define anything then by default cluster ip type service will be created okay now cluster ip service type basically it is used for internal communication okay internal communication that you should know okay that means ki, uh, when we don't define anything ki what kind of service we are creating by default it's going to be cluster ip service type and cluster ip service type is used for internal communication so internally when this pods wants to communicate then cluster ip service type is going to be used okay okay now let's talk about node port a node uh, remember this cluster ip completely internal communication node port external to internal okay so let me explain you how now let's say this is my worker node okay this is my worker node and let's say this is an application pod running and this is the service of this pod okay okay now as you know that when we want to access the application i have mentioned you that first we uh, uh, access request we send to the service then through service access request goes to pod correct so <coughs> this is node okay this is node n1 okay now when we want to access the application so uh, cluster ip we cannot use because from outside to internal we are want to access right this is internal this is outside right so when you want to access to the uh, service uh, access to the application from outside what we need to do basically uh, we can open a port on the worker node okay there will be port open let's say this is the port as uh, 30000 okay port is 30000 port i have opened so now request will be going on this port which is the node port because this port is open on node and from here request will be going to service and then from here we can access the application okay but the problem with node port is it's not very secure because we should not be opening any port on the node worker node that is not a good practice okay but you should just know i'll show you also how this node port will be working okay but you should know ki node port node port service type is a kind of service type in which we access the application from outside to <coughs> in, in internal through opening a port on the worker node okay like this talking this is the uh, node port okay which is not very secure just remember that and here we just open a port on the new worker node and from there we send the request to service and then to application okay talking about third kind of service which is load balancer okay and load balancer is one of the very interesting application uh, very uh, interesting like service type because it is like a very good way of accessing the application from outside okay one way is to access the application through node port but node port is not a good practice okay but if you want to just do something for testing purpose you can use it okay but on uh, production level this, this should not be used so next we have load balancer service type in that basically what happens let me show you that as well so 
let's say this is the worker node okay pod one okay and we have service okay now from outside if you want to access to this uh, uh this application you know what load load balancer is going to do it's going to create its own service type okay let's say s2 and it's external okay it's an external and now this will be directly connected to the pod which we want to access okay so let's say like we want to access our application uh, front end pod so when we are using load balancer instead of going here the request will be directly going to the pod from a uh, service type load balancer service type okay this is basically what a load balancer service type is okay and this is a very good way of accessing your application externally okay basically and you know when you are using load balancer it will generate a uh, specific url also to access the application okay external url external url or an ip address external ip address will be generated in order to access this application okay and as i mentioned this is a very safe way to access your application to open an external access to the application okay so that's a very good thing right but there is an option which is the little bit more better than this also so that is we have fourth kind of service type which is ingress okay now ingress in service type you know what is what is going to happen is that <coughs> let's say this is the uh, worker node okay this is the worker node and let's say this is the pod p1 and its uh, relevant service is this one okay now ingress is also used for external access to the application okay so in ingress what is going to happen the connection is sent, request is sent directly to service from outside and here also we are not opening any port on node worker node we are not opening port and from here we are going to directly send the request to service okay if any let's say if any other components is there so it to its service the request will be going to from ingress okay and using ingress we can also create like uh, we can uh, use like uh, https methods okay so that's a very good in, uh, option but yeah just remember uh, in load balancer what we do we a load balancer has its own service which is going to send request directly to the pod while <laughs> ingress when we are using for external access we send the request to uh, service okay and then we access the application okay so these are <coughs> four kind of uh, services which we should know okay okay team so now let us create virtual machines and using that we are going to create our self-hosted kubernetes cluster okay so i'll i'm going to click on launch instance and number of instance i want is going to be let's say three okay out of which one will be master node and two will be worker node okay and version of virtual machine i'm going to take 20.04 <coughs> instance size type will be t2.large and key this is already present on my local so i can select this talking about networking so i have already shown you the ports which i have been opened on my security group okay and storage i'm going to take 20.0 uh, 20 GIB, okay click on launch instance okay, let me refresh the page okay so these three are the ones so let's name them quickly m1 for master then we have worker node 1 and worker node 2 okay this will be just m for master node <coughs> so we have three virtual machines and we can use these virtual machines to create our kubernetes cluster okay so first let us connect to them so first i am going to connect master node using ssh put the ip address here username then advanced as such we are going to select the private key and this should be present here this is the key okay select this and yeah so this got connected we can just rename this one time that will be master color also we can customize so i'm gonna just, just going to set it up as green okay 
and I'm going to clone this duplicate this and here I'm going to rename so changes will be this will be worker dash one okay this is going to be worker node color also let me change it to this and IP address so IP address I can get from here as worker node one okay then again create a clone this is going to be worker node 2 and IP address so that we can get from here worker node 2 okay this is fine and let us open all of them okay master worker 1 worker 2 now <coughs> we have connected to all of them right you can see now let us uh, set up things okay so first command that we need to run everywhere sudo apt update here also sudo apt update to update the packages so that uh, the packages available in default linux repository will be available for us to use okay pretty update okay so this is done let me clear the screen here also and yeah it's getting done now the commands we need to use so we have uh, commands which we run we need to run on master node and worker node then <coughs> command we need to run on master node command on we need to run on master nodes okay so what i'm going to do is create a shell script out of it so i'm going to copy the whole command okay just to let you know what exactly happening here we are inst uh, we are like installing docker installing kubernetes packages and then we are installing kubeadm kubectl which will be used for a uh, command line interface for communicating with uh, kubernetes cluster and kubelet which you know as it's at this point used for creating the components like uh, pods and all okay okay team so in order to run those commands what i can do first of all i'll become root on all of these machines okay Now we have the commands ready and we can run them. Okay. So commands are here. Let me run them one by one. See, I am not converting it into shell script so that you can understand these very easily. Okay. Okay. So first command, we are just updating the packages so that we can uh, make sure that we have all the packages in the uh, Linux repository available for usage okay then we are installing docker just restarting docker one time <coughs> then we are going to basically add the uh, packages for uh, that is required for kubernetes installation okay And after that we have again like once we have whenever we add the new package uh, to the uh, Linux we need to update also so that those packages become available for usage new package that installed become available for usage okay then we have final commands to install kubeadm kubectl and kubelet so basically you know uh, kubeadm is going to be needed for setting up kubernetes kubectl is going to be used and it's going to work as a CLI okay command line interface so that we can communicate with Kubernetes for like installing or setting up any kind of components or deployments then we have uh, kubelet kubelet is going to be uh, used for like uh, creation of pods okay or any other component like that so let's install all of these this was we need to run on master worker node boot now we need to run this command on only master node and i'll explain why so basically we are initializing and mentioning that uh, what will be the cidr what will be the network range for creation of our 
this uh, when we, we are setting up kubernetes cluster so what will be the network range okay so uh, this we need to run on just on master and i'll tell you what will happen now so it will create a specific kind of <coughs> uh, command join command okay now when it creates the join command so that join command we can use to make any virtual machine as a worker node okay prerequisite for any worker node uh, any virtual machine to become a worker node is that that worker node should be having these commands ran like that means it should be having docker installed it should be having kubeadm it should be having kubectl and it should be having kubelet once they have then we just need to run a specific join command to make them as a worker node okay so let's wait for this okay now if you look closely here this is a join command kubeadm join okay along with a token okay and you see this uh, specific port also as uh, clearly here because i mentioned as i mentioned ki this also should be opened okay so this command is the command that is going to be used to join other virtual machine as a worker node okay so if i copy this command and paste it on my worker node 1 you will see the output soon okay and from there you can understand okay this worker node has just become as a uh, like uh, this this uh, virtual machine has just become a worker node and connected to the master node you can see here this node has joined the cluster okay great same thing we are going to make this uh, virtual machine as a worker node paste this command join command and this will join the cluster okay you can see this node has joined the cluster right now we have few more commands so i would suggest like uh, this command that you are seeing join command make sure that you have saved it somewhere okay you have saved it somewhere local so that next time if you want to make any other uh, virtual machine as a worker node you can just run this command okay now we need to have uh, other commands to run so first we are going to yeah this already we ran next we are going to create run this command so this command is basically used to set up and provide permission uh, so that we can have access to config file i'll show you that as well in a minute and basically config file contains complete configuration of the kubernetes cluster which is going to be used or required for us i'll show you in a minute let me just run these commands first okay basically this is with here we are changing the ownership of this uh, this location so that we can access this config file contents of this config file i will show you in a minute okay next we have step 4 which is uh, we are going to need to run these uh, yaml files on our kubernetes cluster okay this is calico okay so basically calico is a, a plugin which is used for networking okay whatever network aspect of the whole kubernetes cluster should be there so that is handled by calico okay so that's why we are setting up calico okay and then we have another yaml file which we need to have this is uh, for ingress nginx controller okay so these two things are network based uh, like uh, things that we need to have on our cluster okay now everything is installed correct now let me show you a few things first command that we can run here is kubectl get nodes here we can see we have one node as a master which is also call, called as control plane okay then we have two other nodes which is worker node 1 and worker node 2 okay that means our kubernetes cluster is ready right now showing you the config file okay so the location of config file is here let me show you if i go to cd slash root slash sorry if i go to this location you can see there is a config file if i cat this config file okay let me show you what exactly it contains first of all you see this is the api url of the cluster this is certificate authoritative data okay and then we have name of the cluster which is kubernetes correct and then we have users kubernetes admin okay then certificate uh, client certificate data okay so these are required when we are working with kubernetes we want to connect to kubernetes for, from anywhere from jenkins or any other local machine so this is what required okay so <clears throat> this is done right 
Kubernetes is set up. Correct. Now let me show you like how we can have like how we can use YAML files to create or deploy our application. Okay team. So now we are going to do proper hands on. Okay. So for that whatever manifest files you need they are added here. You can check them out and in detail explanation of those manifest files is added here. Okay. But properly I am going to explain as well. So first let us understand what exactly we are going to deploy. Okay. So the best example in order to understand the concept of all the resources, all the components in Kubernetes like config map, C creates, persistent volume, persistent volume claim, deployments, pod, service. We can best example is to go with MongoDB. Okay. Why I say so? Because in MongoDB we are going to have a database and along with that we are going to have front end. Okay. So on database we can put the persistent volume concept and rest of the concept we can put in together. Okay. Let me explain you through a diagrammatic structure how exactly we are going to do that. Let me remove this. Okay. Yes. So basically this is what we are going to do. First of all we are going to create a pod for uh, Mongo Express. Okay. Which is which will be acting as a front end. Mongo Express front end. Okay. Then we need to make sure that we have database also pod created okay and as i mentioned for communication we have services right so both of the component are going to have their own services okay after that what is going to happen because front end needs to connect to database in order to put the details okay so <coughs> for that what we are going to have what we are going to do first of all we are going to create another component which is config map as I mentioned config map is the component which is going to store the uh, database URLs okay and as I mentioned previously also okay, when you want to access the component directly we don't access how do we access first we uh, connect to service and then we connect to the service will forward the request to pod same thing going to happen here also so we are going to connect to database pod the information of database will be stored by connecting to service okay so information will be in config map the URL okay also database may have its own credentials as well right so credentials of database we are going to store inside a secret file okay a, a file known as secret so we are going to store in that okay after that uh, see uh, there will be a credential for front end also so front end credentials we are going to uh, store in front end secret files okay Now one thing that we need to understand ki if we want to access to the database from front end we need to have access to our database credentials as well correct. So we are going to have access at that as well access as well and we need to have we need to have access to this also for to in order to get the URL of database right okay after that as I mentioned ki uh, persistent volume and persistent volume claim we are going to connect to database first uh, making sure that uh, data is not lost so this is the persistent volume and this will be the, some physical storage we'll be creating okay in order to access this physical storage we are uh, database component is going to use pvc which is known as persistent volume claim okay so from pvc there going there there is going to be a request to pv to get this storage okay and this is what we are going to do and as I mentioned to in order to access this project we are going to go over service of front end okay and this is how we are going to access and this is what we are going to create now okay so let's do that I hope this is clear and this will be more clear once we implement it okay so first thing what we need to do first thing we are going to create uh, there are certain components we need to create okay first is going to be let's say config map which will store the uh, database information okay and then we are going to have secrets also which will be storing the mongodb secrets mongodb credentials okay you might be able to see this is like not very uh, proper username and password okay just to let you know this is a password which is uh, you can understand this is base 64 encoded okay for example the general password that we are supposed to use is admin admin is going to be the username password is let's say password i am keeping as one two three okay so we cannot directly put username and password 
very openly so what we need to do so team convert into base 64 what we need to do let's say we have username admin and password as 123 so in order to add those details in our credentials what we are going to do we need to type echo hyphen n then the uh, value which we want to convert in our case it let's say it's admin okay and we want to encode it into base 64 okay now this value that you see this is the encoded version of admin same thing let's say i want to do for password so in my case the password is one two three okay and yeah password encoded version is mi this one okay you get you got it right so that's what we are doing for this is the username and password for mongodb mongodb username and password i have set it to uh, admin one two three okay so this is the secret for mongodb and Mong then we have secret for mongo express okay but as i mentioned that we need to uh, we need to access from the front end from mongo express front end component to database that means front end also need to access have database secrets right so what we are doing while creating the secret for mongo express this is the mongo database username and password and this is the mongo express username and password okay so from this value these two values these two values are going to be uh, username password for database and this is the username password for the mongo express which is the front end okay then once we have secrets then we have deployment okay talking about deployment so deployment is the uh, component when we create deployment it's going to create the pods okay one more thing about deployment let me explain you in a bit okay so let's say when we are creating deployment okay let's say we created deployment now this deployment is going to create the pods okay so this deployment is going to create the pods and let's say in my deployment i have written as that replicas will be two so it's going to create two pods okay now you know even if i delete pod one automatically deployment will create the new one okay and if i delete the pod two then again deployment is going to create pod a new pod two okay that means if we want to delete the pods we need to delete the deployment then only pods will be getting deleted remember this key pods is going to create uh, sorry deployment is going to create the pods and the reason of doing this is because key it, it the deployment makes sure that pods are always up and running whatever number of pods we have defined it is always up and running and anytime if it gets deleted or anything deployment will immediately create a new pod okay and if you want to remove or delete the pod we need to delete the deployment then only pods will be getting deleted okay now coming back here okay so here this is a deployment file right and you know in yaml deployment file they have certain sections for example first is always going to be the api version then the kind give what kind of resource we want to create so here we are going to create deployment right then metadata metadata is nothing but just like basic information here what we are providing we are providing name as mongodb okay and labels okay labels is going to be used for identifications then we have spec which is short for specification so this is the specification of the deployment okay here you can see sorry yeah this is the uh, specification of the pod which deployment is going to create here replicas we have mentioned one that means only one pod should be created now this section is very much important selector okay so you know like uh, as i mentioned ki there will be a service created right for each pod that you create uh, for each pod there will be a service right for example this is my pod 1 okay and in order for to make sure that this pod is able to communicate to other pods we are going to have service correct because service is the one which is going to help for the communication between pods right now while creating the service how do we tell the service that okay you belong to this pod how do we to tell that because so so you know uh, what we do basically this is the section selector here we write some match labels like some sort of identification key, okay using this a service can identify key, this is the mongodb pod mongodb okay if i scroll down here service okay so here also we have selector selector app mongodb 
So using this thing, using this part, this service will know that I need to connect to MongoDB, uh, MongoDB ports. Okay, you can see here, same thing happening here. Ha like same thing present here, match, match label, app, MongoDB. Here also, selector, app, MongoDB. Okay, and using this, the service will know that, okay, I need to connect to this MongoDB ports. Okay, scrolling down uh, below. So then we have another, uh, this is the template. Okay. Now this template is going to be the configuration for creation of the pod. Here the specification will you will see in the specification the containers will going to be created. Container name we are giving as MongoDB and then we are using a Docker image of Mongo. Okay, and by default the port that on which the MongoDB will be accessible is 27,017. That is the reason I was saying that we need to have this port open in our security group. Okay, then we have environments. So basically, uh, in environments, what we do in environments, we need to uh, provide certain like uh, username and password because th those are the default environments we need to have, right? In case of MongoDB, we are providing key the default username and password of MongoDB database is going to be. See, we de first of all we define the variable, right? After that, what will be the value? So value for that we need to we have already created a secret file. So we are here we are writing the value will be uh, fetched from secret key reference. Okay, which secret key? The name of the secret key which we have created MongoDB secret, and which uh, like which value we want to use? We want to use username. Okay, for this variable. Then we have second variable or second environment you can say MongoDB init like initial DB root password. Okay, so again value from from where we are getting the value secret key reference. Okay, which secret key reference we are uh, like getting? Or using MongoDB secret. This is the name of the secret file and which value key. Uh, sorry, password. Password we are using. Okay. Then we are creating volume mounts. Okay. We are defining key the data of this MongoDB where it should be uh, done. Okay. Like data of this uh, this MongoDB where it should be stored. So this will be stored on this location. This location is inside the Kubernetes pod. Okay. The MongoDB pod on this uh, inside that MongoDB pod. This is the location on which our data will be stored for MongoDB database. Okay. Then here, as I as I mentioned, we need to make sure that our um, database is like stateful or like no data is being lost even if the MongoDB pod is deleted, right? So for that, we are what we are doing. We are using PVC to claim the storage that we have created using persistent volume. The claim name is going to be PVC. Okay. So and okay yeah and then we have the service file service file for mongodb again first section is api version then kind kind is service okay and if you see here service type is not at all mentioned that means if service type is not mentioned by default it's going to be a cluster ip cluster ip is a service type used for internal communication okay so here what we define again selector you remember that for, this is used for connecting to the correct pod okay then we have ports protocol we are using tcp and you see here two kind of port we have target port and just port what exactly do they mean so let me explain you that as well okay so let's say <coughs> this is the worker node okay and this is the let's say mongodb pod okay and then we have this service of mongodb pod okay so uh, port that was written port is the uh, the port that is going to be open here so we have defined that it's going to be 27017 uh, okay and the target port is going to be the port open on the container running inside the pod right so that also we have defined this okay so do not forget this port is the uh, port that is exposed for the service okay exposed on the service and the target port is the port on the uh, open on the container running inside the pod okay because you know every time any request comes to pod it goes through service so if, if some request come to access the pod the uh, request will be going something like this it will go to the service then it will go to from service it will be forwarded to pod and where exactly it, is, it should be forwarded so it should be forwarded on this port right for service also the request will be coming to here okay so that's why we have a uh, uh, port and target port okay port is 
port is the uh, specific port open uh, exposed on the service target port is the port exposed on the container on which our application is running okay so in this way we can create the uh, we in this way we can create the service of the mongodb okay now one thing you remember here as i mentioned from the diagram itself okay that means if i want to access mongodb database i need to send request to service correct and we are going to use this information to create the config map config map as i mentioned this is this stores the information about database url and all okay api version kind is going to be config map okay then metadata metadata nothing but just like name you can give to this service okay name to you can give to this component okay here we are giving the name mongodb config map and then we now we need to provide the database url okay data inside database we are writing db host and you can clearly see i am writing mongodb service why i am writing mongodb service because if we want to access mongodb database we need to send the request to service of mongodb database right that's why i have written because if i send a request to a service of mongodb database that request will be forwarded to pod of mongodb right that's why in while creating the config map for connecting from mongodb x sorry mongo express to mongodb database we need to provide the name of service okay that's exactly what has been done moving forward to mongo express which is going to be used as a front end for accessing the application here also sections will be there first api version then kind which is deployment then name name is mongo express which is the front end for mongo db database okay and here also replicas we are just using one okay scrolling down to selector selector if you remember this is the section which is going to be used for matching the service to the deployment or the pod okay because the service we have for mongo express you can see uh, here we are using uh, selector app uh, mongo express okay same thing is defined yeah here right in selectors so from this information service will know okay i belong to this mongo express pods okay now inside mongo express pod let's explain what i am doing this two sections you understand api version kind whatever kind you are creating then metadata some information about the uh, component you are creating okay then specification of the pod so replicas we have defined that it's going to be just one pod okay selector for connecting to a service then we have template okay so in template we are again providing some metadata okay then we have specification okay inside specification we are defining the containers the docker container that is going to be created the name of the container will be mongo express and the docker image that is going to be used for creating the container is mongo express okay then we are defining that the port on which our mongo express will be the port of container will be 8081 okay then again we are using environment now if you notice very clearly you will see certain very interesting things okay first we have uh, you know these values if you are wondering from where these environments are coming so basically what i have done if i went to docker mongo okay if i go here you'll be able to see these are some default environments okay let me scroll down and yeah here you can see these are some default environments and that's what exactly i am using okay i hope that's clear so <laughs> these details like this is for mongo express so if i go to docker image mongo express details there i'll be able to find these in environments okay now talking about what exactly is this environment so this environment means this is the username for accessing mongo express i'm not talking about mongo database i'm talking about mongo express which is the front end and this is the password right again value we are storing in the uh, secret of this file mongo express secret okay and uh, password a password also we are storing there okay then we have me config mongodb ad admin username now this is the username for mongodb database and this is the password for mongodb database okay one more thing that we need to give is the url of mongodb so we can put that value inside uh, config mongodb server and here see if, for storing like for fetching the uh, username password we are using secret key reference but for getting the database url because we have stored it inside config map right so here we are using value from config map reference okay and then name of the config map and then key 
db host which we have defined okay now this is what we we can do for like the first thing like uh, this is going to be the uh, mongodb uh, database and mongodb uh, mongo express uh, deployment and yaml okay after that we need to have persistent volume and persistent volume claim okay now you see uh, persistent volume is the is going to be a storage on a physical location okay and we can like see you know uh, we can make any specific folder uh, persistent volume and we can use it okay basically if you are unaware like how to write you can simply take a, a template for persistent volume from chat gpt or from like official pages you just need to make sure that this is the exact path which you want to uh, like use as persistent volume and there will be a storage how much storage you want to give okay then we have persistent volume claim, claim which is going to be used for fetching this okay the storage accessing the storage okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to create a volume let me show you that and the volume that i'm going to create it's going to be done on master master node okay so what i'm going to do cd and mongo mongo dash we are going to go inside this folder and let's create a folder mongo okay let's go inside mongo folder and here we are going to create mongo volume folder okay okay so now we have created the folders and folders are available now that means the volume we have created okay now this volume will become the persistent volume okay and yeah then using persistent volume claim we can request this volume as well okay so let's do that okay team so now we are going to create the resources okay so for that what i am going to do i am going to create a directory name will be just step okay so let's go inside it and here we are going to create our files which we want to deploy and all the files that i am going to use will be in the description of this uh, video so you can just check them out as well so first let us create persistent volume and persistent volume claim okay path already we have created one like uh, physical storage on this uh, master master node okay so let's create this uh, pv dash pvc dot yaml and we are going to paste it here one more thing before you do any kind of like deployment do one thing make sure that uh, use you are using yaml lint to verify if your uh, file is syntax based correct or not you can see valid yaml it's it's a valid or not yeah that you need to check okay so we have created first file now what we need to do we need to run this command kubectl apply hyphen f then name of the file this will deploy the file okay you can see persistent volume and persistent volume claim created right that is first thing done <coughs> moving to next so next we are going to uh, create the these deployments file okay okay so first what i'm going to do i'm going let me check uh, secret okay so first i'm going to create secrets okay so I will copy this let me check everything seems fine okay and we are going to create uh, secrets dot yaml now secrets are also created mongodb secret and mongo express secret okay so after secret what we need to do we need to uh, let me check mongo this is mongodb right yeah mongodb and mongo service okay so let's create mongodb service and uh, sorry mongodb and mongo express okay so first of all i'll verify everything fine okay and <coughs> before we create mongo express what we need to do we need to make sure that our mongo config map is also created okay because config map requires mongo db service to be up okay so let me copy this 
and this is MongoDB service, right? This seems fine. Let me just check. Okay, this is fine. Now, in this time, we are going to create MongoDB, MongoDB pod, MongoDB service, Mongo Express pod, Mongo Express service, and Mongo MongoDB config map. Okay, so let's do that as well. So we are going to create a new file, Mongo dot yaml this single file contains mongo express mongo db both okay let's paste it here everything seems fine we are creating in the order that it should be created okay let me save this and let us create this as well all the resources are created now one by one let's check the status kubectl get deployment first of all we are going to check deployment okay so they are getting started okay and obviously this may take little bit of time so we'll we are gonna wait for it after that we may check other things kubectl get secrets so uh secret is up right mongo express secret and mongo db secret both are up and running fine then we have mongo get pv uh, persistent volume is also created and <coughs> pvc that is also created okay this is fine now again let's check the deployment so okay now you can see deployment is already available one now let's check kubectl get pods and both of the pods are running okay <coughs> and we can check kubectl get svc service for service we can write either service or short for svc also okay so service is also running and our application should be accessible on this node port okay just to let you know i am using uh if i go back here mongo express <coughs> I'm using a service node port type. You know why? Because we are, we are uh, using a self-hosted Kubernetes. Okay, and by default, load balancer may not be available in this, so we may not be able to generate the resources. Uh, may not we may not be able to generate the external IP using load balancer. Okay, in case we want to use load balancer, we are going to use it through cloud Kubernetes service, which I am going to show you in a minute. Okay, first let us see this. Okay, so let's wait for this to complete everything. And let's see if our application is up and running okay okay so <coughs> let's say for some reason you may not able to see your application so in that case how do we debug okay okay team so in order to troubleshoot or see what is what may be the status for our application to not get up we can first of all get pods and we can get detailed information about this pod okay for example like let's check the uh, status of kubectl get logs okay and sorry kubectl logs and the pod whose log you want to see okay so we can see this log this pod log okay and i don't see any specific error or so so it's let it be okay and let's try to see the uh, logs of this pod right Some issue is there, but uh, I guess it will be fixed within some time automatically because uh, when you need uh, first time you run this, so Mongo Express take few minutes to be able to access MongoDB. Okay, okay team. So just you got to know uh, like how we can troubleshoot or how we can check the logs, right? So if I run this again, now we can see, okay, Mongo Express server is listening and so and so. That means our uh, we can access our uh, our like Mongo Express server is listening on this port. Okay, and also server is open to allow connection. That means it is fine, right? okay now in order to make sure key uh, how we can access our application what we can run we can run get svc as i mentioned why we need to get svc because as i mentioned previously also uh, services are the ones uh, through which we can access our application right and here mongo express service is running is uh, like its port is 
32,492. That means we can access it there, right? Okay. So let's uh, try to access it. And for that, first of all, we'll go here. Uh, EC2 dashboard. Okay. And it should be running on one of the worker node. Let's try to check it out. You can go here. And port was default port uh, 32492, right? Okay. You can see it is asking for username and password and username password we have already set up to admin password which should be one two three okay as soon as i uh, provide that details we are able to access it okay but now i wanted to show you the reality like uh, how exactly we will know that our application is persist is like stateful or like uh, it, it is connected to persistent volume for that what, what i'm going to do first of all let's let's create a database named aditya okay we just created database aditya and let's say another uh, database we can create named aditi okay two database we have created right also let's do one thing uh, kubectl <coughs> get pods what i'm going to do i'm going to go inside this database pod okay okay team so now i want to show you the persistent volume part right so for that first of all let's uh, get the pods kubectl get pods okay and now we want to go inside this pod mongodb pod right so let me show you that how we can do kubectl same way that we do in docker same way we can do here kubectl exec hyphen it the name of the mongodb pod okay and then uh, using the terminal which terminal we want to access so we will go with bin bash okay now we are inside this pod okay and as you remember if i try to show you if i go here <coughs> uh, where is the uh, mongodb yes so mongodb you can see mount path is this one that means our all the information all the data will be stored inside this on the pod okay so if i go inside slash data slash db okay so whatever new things we are creating new uh, like uh, everything whatever we are doing with respect to database all the information will be stored here okay now what i want to show you i'm going to create a new file here aditya.txt right i created now this file is created here right let's create one more file just for assurance aditi okay dot txt file okay so two files we have created aditya and aditi and the, what actually i wanted to show you is that when we and also like two databases we have created right so since we are already using persistent volume that means even the pod gets deleted the data won't be getting deleted okay so for that just to show you what i am going to do if i run kubectl get pod what i am going to do i am going to delete the pod okay kubectl delete pod and the pod name so as soon as i delete it uh, deployment will create a new pod okay if you remember here <coughs> i explained that whenever you delete a just pod deployment will automatically create a new pod right so if i delete the, this pod the new pod will be getting created but main focus is to understand that if the data that we stored inside the database as well as some new files that we created that is being deleted or that is being retained okay if it is retained that means our persistent volume is properly connected and it's working fine and our application is stateful set okay so i just deleted okay this part is now deleted okay so <clears throat> let's wait for this to complete okay so that is completed right next what we can do if i run this command again kubectl get pods now one thing that you can clearly see that this is a different pod from the name itself you can see that right so what we are going to do we are going to first of all we are going to here refresh the page let's wait for a few minutes okay so after refresh also these two database you can see they are existing right now let's go inside the pod using the, the same command that we had but this time the pod is different right because new pod has been created so we are going to get this pod details put it here and now if we can go inside it right 
cd slash data slash db ls now you see even the pod is new one but data that we created is existing you can see here right aditi and adita these two files are existing as well as the database that we created inside the database that is also persisting that means the persistent volume part is working successfully and it's working fine correct so that is how we can work with self hosted kubernetes okay okay team so what i want to show you now is the role based access control which is rbac okay and this is a feature that is being used widely in every single company okay i'll explain in detail okay so before that what i'm going to do i'm going to remove all the uh, resources that we created okay so that we can do kubectl delete deployment and yeah this two deployments we are going to delete okay this is deleted then we have kubectl get svc then we are going to delete this as well kubectl delete svc you know when i say that i wanted to show you the rbac so basically through that i'll be showing you how exactly deployments happen in companies okay in what ways okay so this is also deleted let's delete these secrets kubectl get secrets so first we are going to delete this secret and then this secret okay now we can delete the kubectl get the we need to delete this as well this may take some time i guess or maybe let me see cube ctl get pvc okay let me first try to delete this okay yeah so both are deleted now okay now talking about uh, rbac so basically what exactly is that let me discuss that okay so let me remove this give me one second give me okay so let me explain you rbac thing so basically in rbac what happens you know generally like over youtube or many places you will see that everyone is using like root account to deploy right which is never a good practice why because root account is something that is supposed to be used for like higher usage okay if like uh, some big things you need to install or you need to set up for that one it is supposed to use because root access root user has complete access okay which should not be used for deployment so instead what we do we create a user okay and this user we are going to call as service account why we are creating creating a, a separate uh, separate user is because like this user will be common for everyone okay a, who, team members can use this service account username and password to do any kind of task with respect to a cluster okay and its credential won't be expiring because in, in companies generally employees credential usually expire okay and you know once we create this user account then next thing that we are going to create is a role okay role is basically a group of permissions okay we are create we are going to create a group of permissions okay and we are going to assign this inside a role so this role that we create this role will be having specific kind of permission like let's say i want to give permission like to uh, create some resource to deploy delete resource to deploy re applications all those kind of uh, permissions will be inside that role okay after that what we do we assign this role to this user 
so once this user is assigned with this role that means now user will also be having the this group of permissions that means now user can also uh, do deployment delete resources or any such such things okay and you know like decision key what kind of permission we need to do that is also done properly so that use uh, the service account that we are going to use for deployment it has a limited level of access like for example let's say i just want my service account to create resources and not delete resources so i can define that in my roles okay that's why it's better option to always go with a service account okay and this this whole thing like creating a separate role with specific permissions and then assigning this role to the a specific user which is also known as service account this whole set of things is known as uh, like rbsc role based access control because we are giving the uh, like access level of access but that is limited okay it has specific only le level of access okay so that is like role based access control okay so that's what we are even going to do okay so how to do that so first of all what we are going to do we are going to create a service account okay so let's let me show you that as well so for doing that what we can do uh, we can go to this my account my uh, github repository you will get all the uh, details in this one single file create master you will get all the everything that you need to do okay okay so going here step cks okay first thing that we are going to do is create a service account and you know there is a concept of uh, like uh, namespaces in uh, kubernetes okay i think that is also very important so let me explain you quickly that okay so that you don't uh, get confused about namespaces okay so basically let's say when we want to deploy any application inside kubernetes we can create pods right we can create pods p1 we can create second application pod p2 right but if they are openly everywhere pods then it's not very good so inside kubernetes what we do we create groups okay let's say this create uh, i created a project or i created this project can also be called as namespace okay now namespace is like specific to projects for example like for my uh, application app one i created this namespace okay and I, i will define that whatever pods that i want to create for my application app one those pods are going to be created in this project only or in this namespace only okay and then again i have another application which we want to call as let's say uh, app two okay so for that i am going to create another namespace and the the pods of that project uh, that application app 2 will be created within this namespace okay now you, you can see this becomes very much easier to maintain or manage your projects or your applications because every the all the pods of that specific application will be inside a separate namespace okay this is like let's say this namespace is one this is namespace two okay so same thing we are going to do here also we are going to create a separate namespace and we are going to perform the deployment in that specific namespace okay so let's do one thing first of all let's create a service account okay so for doing that this is the command that we need to run in order to create the service account so let me do that okay so we are going to create a file svc account okay dot yaml which the commands and here the name of our service account is going to be jenkins and the namespace inside which we want to deploy our project is going to be web web apps okay and you can see it is very simple api version kind the service account then metadata okay so this is done now let us sorry one more thing team you can see ki okay we are saying ki we want to create this service account inside namespace web apps but we have not created web apps right so what we can do we can create names uh, namespace web apps so for that we can simply run the command kubectl create namespace and the name or uh, name of the namespace which we want to create is which is web apps right done now we can Uh, like create the service account kubectl apply hyphen f okay and the name of the file which we created okay one more thing team uh, one small thing i wanted to discuss with you so that uh, you should know that when we like when we run this command kubectl apply right which is let me open the notepad okay so uh, when we run this command kubectl uh, kubectl apply right 
to apply any changes right or create a deployment okay but in general there are two commands kubectl apply and kubectl create okay now main difference between them ki create command kubectl create command can be used only for first time if you want to create new resource in that case we are going to run kubectl create hyphen f for the file location then the uh, name of the file okay this will be useful for when you want to create resource for the first time while apply can be used in both cases if you want to update any resource then also you can use apply if you want to create a resource for the first time then also can you can use apply and for the same for that reason only i am using only apply because if one command can do both of the both of the task then why need, why we need to create multiple commands we can only go with apply okay but yeah just for knowledge you should know create can be used to create resources for the first time but if you want to uh, use a command that can create resources for the first time as well as can apply the updates or changes to the created resource so single command we can use kubectl apply okay so i hope uh, this was also clear coming back so where were we yes so service account we have created but this service account is created inside the namespace okay inside the namespace web apps so after we have created this service account next thing is we need to create a role and you can say ki inside this role what kind of resources we want to have permission on is like pods config maps deployments these many things right and what kind of access we want to give get access list access watch access create access update patch and delete which is almost everything okay so next we are going to create this role let's do that and i'm going to create the role dot yaml okay and we are going to paste it here now what it's doing it's creating a role okay now let's uh, create this again kubectl apply hyphen f okay so now role is also created and if you notice very clearly we have created the role inside namespace okay now we have created the role we have created the service account so now we need to assign this role to service account so that these permissions which we have defined in our role can be uh, can be applied to service account so that service account can perform these kind of actions on these kind of resources okay so for binding the role to service account what we are going to do is we are going to use role binding component okay and here you can very clearly see what we are doing we are binding the uh, name app role to a service account inside the namespace web apps okay and the name of the service account is jenkins okay so let's do this as well bind dot yaml paste this and let's save this okay and again let's uh, sorry about that we are going to create this binding resource also okay so this is also done right now we have created service account we have given a specific level of permissions to it next thing what is pending next thing we can create a token which will be used for authentication for our service account okay okay so for creating the uh, the secret of a service account what we can do we can use this okay and i will just copy this is official page you can see and i'm going to write to vi c sorry secret dot yaml okay paste it here but here you see it is asking the service account name and as you remember our service account name is jenkins correct so we will provide the name save this file but here one more thing you notice we have not defined the namespace there is no namespace defined here okay so if it is not already defined uh, inside your uh, yaml file what you can do let me show you that as well apply hyphen n that means we are we are providing a namespace name okay hyphen n now sorry about that let me edit this file also we have secret dot yaml okay now i'm saying that i want to create the service account secret which is going to be used for authentication inside a namespace which which is called web apps okay because inside uh, this uh, 
secret file we are nowhere we have defined the web uh, namespace name right so if we have not defined separately we can just mention hyphen and name of the web uh, namespace and then this secret will be created inside this name web apps namespace okay okay so this part is done now what we are going to do one final small thing we need to do which is to get the token token of a, a namespace sorry token of the secret that we created and that token is going to be used for authentication okay and my secret name that is fine we are going to use a command describe which will give you complete information here we just need to change the name of web apps and this seems fine okay now you see it generated a token right token now this token we need to save it on our local machine so that we can use it afterwards okay so let me okay so i have saved this uh, token which we are going to use it afterwards okay so now what what i am going to do is set up jenkins okay because uh, we need to uh, run the deployment from jenkins okay for that first of all prerequisite for setting up jenkins is that you should be having jdk installed i am going to set up jdk 17 and here it is written headless headless means this version of jdk is not having any ui okay this specific jdk open jdk 17 gre headless it does not have any ui okay so let's install uh, jenkins quickly for that i'm going here and i'm going to install i'm going to get the commands for installing jenkins and these are the commands okay coming back here so jdk install we are going to install now jenkins I hope like rule based access control is clear it's not not so much complex it's simple instead of using any root user account what we do we create a service account and we assign a, we create service account we create a specific rules okay that that role specific ro role we are going to create inside that role we are going to have certain level of permissions and though that role we can assign to any specific user like service account then service account will be having the access to do your deployments and everything else okay and that is the best practice that is being used in companies okay so jenkins is also also installed we can go here ec2 <coughs> sorry about that it got locked out actually but yeah usually i just keep like uh, uh, authenticator so that it's kind of secure and let me put the 268278 okay so this is the master and on master only i have set up okay let me access the jenkins which is going to be 8080 port default port is jenkins 8080 and we need to get the initial admin password so we are going to copy this and cat so this is the initial admin password we are going to copy this and we are going to paste it here okay and we are going to select install service plugins okay now this may take little bit of time based on uh, your network speed how much you are having based on that it may take some time okay also the size of vm also matters like how much resources vm is having so that will also be responsible for how much time does it take so let's wait for it okay team so jenkins is set up let's quickly uh, jenkins is installed so let's quickly set it up okay Okay, so it's set up right now we need to install certain plugins specifically for uh, kubernetes so i'm going to go to available and i'm going to search kubernetes okay so what plugins we need to install first of all this one this one and and just let this one also this three should be useful okay maybe this one also these four will be fine okay so let's install them and let's see if they are working fine or not So once this is installed we are going to create our pipeline okay 
let's wait for this okay almost completed okay so plugin plugin extensions mm -mm -mm. Okay, so it's done. We can go to dashboard and let's create our first pipeline, which is going to be K8. Okay, and kind will be pipeline. And let's go at the end. Let's create a sample pipeline. Okay. Okay, so first step itself, first uh, we need to make sure that uh, where exactly is our source code. Okay. So let's open GitHub and on GitHub we have our source code inside this master. Okay, we need to convert this into YAML, right? Sorry, the name will be Mongo dot Jamal. Okay, rest everything seems okay. Let me save this. So this is the uh, like Jamal file which we can use for deployment. Okay. Meanwhile, let me make this public also so that you people can also use it. Okay, one second. GitHub. See, I try to put everywhere like MFA so that security is maintained. And that's why on my phone also, on GitHub also, I have put this. Okay, yeah, so this is done. And coming back here, we can use this YAML file, right? Let me copy this. Also, just to let you know, some things that I have changed is uh, the order in which I have written this same order it's going to be create getting created the reason that I created uh, uh, like mentioned the components in this format in this order because they are sort of dependent so in that way it will be very useful in the same way they are getting created okay so let's copy the URL of yeah okay and here this will be git checkout and here we are going to put uh the repository we need to put right so <coughs> let's help take help from pipeline syntax this will be this and let me see the branch branch is main and credential is none because it's public so we can write this and this will be our first stage okay so next step in next stage we are going to do the deployment and that we can do Let's provide the name as k8 dash deploy. Okay, and in steps, we need to write the steps to deploy, perform deployment, right? So, again, we are going to take help from pipeline syntax, and this time we are going to search for Kubernetes CLI. Okay, this I guess we can use. You see there are lots of things that we need to put right first of all credentials so credentials we are going to use a uh, secret okay because we have token on our local which i just saved remember copy this paste it here id talking about id so it, let's just give a name as k8 cred or k8 we can give service dash account dash grid okay copy this and paste it here click on add now it should be available now kubernetes server endpoint how do we get it okay so as i told you previously key we have a cube config file okay where exactly it is it is getting stored under user then dot cube ls we have you can see config file right 
so we can view this file see all the information is there so now this is the server endpoint as i mentioned initially when i was explaining the ports you can see 6443 was the port that needs to be opened okay okay cluster name so cluster name let me see i guess name is kubernetes so we can just copy this and paste it here context name just leave it as it is namespace we can put as web apps right and that's all so we have created the block and inside this block we can write the commands to perform the deployment let me remove this some block and okay now in order to perform deployment you see every information that was needed we have provided okay that was mandatory we have provided that so now if i run as such double quotes cube ctl apply hyphen f mongo dot yaml let me just check the spelling correct mongo dot yaml right and that's all and also once the deployment is completed we need to have the uh, since we are not using load balancer okay load balancer is available only when you are working with cloud cloud kubernetes services okay here what i can do cube ctl get svc okay and yeah this should be good and we are already mentioned that we want to deploy inside web apps folder uh, sorry web apps namespace okay so let's see this and run this let's see if any error comes if so then we'll try to fix it okay okay some error it seems and let's see what is the error okay see uh, what issue it's uh, it's facing okay so the thing is key uh, it's unable to create persistent volume and i can understand and other than pv it's unable to create secrets yeah so secrets and uh, this uh, uh, persistent volume it's unable to create okay now you can understand why this happened because we are using a service account and we have not given this kind of permissions to the service account that means we need to give the permission to service account that it should be able to create these resources secrets and persistent volume so let's do that okay team so the error that we have faced for that what are we are going to do we are going to create a another role and we are going to assign that role to service account again okay so let's create that role i'm going to provide the name as role dash one dot yaml and let us paste it here now two files i'm creating first one is role and second is assigning the role okay in this role you can see i have using the um, i have mentioned the resources persistent volumes and secrets and permission i am giving create also so that they can create or update as well okay so let us save this file and this uh, new role will be assigned we can assign this to our uh, 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 yeah we can assign this to our service account okay okay team so this time we have given specific permissions and let's see what happens now so i have triggered the job okay it's still giving the same mirror i guess okay secret it's able to create secret was created but still it is still facing the issue for creation of this uh, persistent volumes okay so yeah let's so let's fix it okay team so the new problem that we are facing is that uh, service account jenkins does not have cluster level access so that it can uh, like get the resource persistent persistent volume it is unable to create that because that requires cluster level access so what we are going to do we are going to create again another role which is going to perform the role.yaml which is going to give the access to create the persistent volume on the cluster level okay so let's do that okay now verbs like kind of uh, permission which, we, which i want to give is going to be this one maybe let me just copy this whole thing 
and second and second Okay, maybe we need to add it manually. What access? Uh, what's create, update, patch, and delete? Okay, create, update, patch. And delete okay and this should be fine I guess okay so let me save this and if you no notice this one thing cluster role this is a cluster role this is a role that is having scope on cluster level okay so let me save this okay and let's apply this cube CTL apply hyphen F Roll dash two, okay, and okay. So this is done, and I guess mm -mm -mm. let me just check the service account if secret name has been changed or not. And secret name is not changed, so we can again try to run the job, and let's see what happens. Build scheduled okay great now you can see uh where is it yeah this resource is also able to be changed right and do not worry like see these many resources whichever i have created uh the rule bindings so those commands i'll just share with you as well in the repository which you can use okay so now this our application should be accessible over 31197 right but before that let's quickly check it ourselves cube ctl get parts you see it's saying no resource found in default namespace because we are deployed we have deployed in web apps right and yeah it seems running but there are restarts that means we need to check the log one time cube ctl uh, cube ctl logs and the uh, mongodb first let me check mongodb sorry about that hyphen n every time we need to run like uh, web apps so it seems fine okay and let's check for uh, 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 mongo express as well okay so server is open and to allow connections that means it should be we should be able to access it okay let me get the ip address three one one nine seven admin one two three okay so yes this is how we deploy and yeah through this you understand different problems that we may face uh, this service account issue right so make sure to check it out and make sure to visit the repository because i'll be adding all those commands whichever we use for fixing our issues so those will be added as well okay so make sure to check this repository out i'll be updating it soon and yes team so that will be all for today i hope this was useful for you and if it was then make sure to give it a like so thanks for watching and have a nice day